Today's July 27th, 2014. It's a Sunday morning and we're holding a ceremony of sorts at the Shire Free Church this morning. I am offering a reading from the book Why Peace, edited by Mark Gutman. Uh, this section is written by David Swanson, titled, Why Am I a Peace Activist? Why Aren't You? More than any other description, except for perhaps husband and father, I have been for the past six years a peace activist. Yet I hesitate on the question of how to tell my personal story of experience with war. I recently visited Afghanistan briefly in order to speak with people who have experienced war. I've spoken with many U.S. soldiers on non-U.S. victims of war, but I have no personal experience of war. Being in Washington, D.C. on September 11, 2001 doesn't change that. By the time a crime had been transformed into a war, the war had already moved elsewhere. I know a Vietnam veteran who opposed that war, but grew so tired of being told he wasn't qualified to do so that he joined up. Once he got back, for decades since, he has been opposing wars with the benefit of the aura of someone who knows war. I don't have that, and I certainly do not want it. I value war opposition by those who have known war, but I value other war opposition as well. I also imagine we can all spot the fatal flaw in any proposal that would have people experience wars before they could expose them. In 2006, a congressional candidate and Iraq veteran in Ohio who was speaking on a panel with me urged requiring military service for all politicians so that they could oppose militarism with greater knowledge of the military. Raise your hand if you think that would work. So the obvious question is probably how I became a peace activist. To my mind, however, the question has always been why anybody is not. I understand that there's not a lot of job openings for professional peace activists, but there are unlimited part-time volunteer positions. When I grew up as a kid in Northern Virginia in a family that had no one in the military and no one opposing the military, we had a guest come to visit. He very much wanted to see the U.S. Naval Academy in Annapolis, Maryland. So we drove him over there and showed him around. He was quite impressed, but I became physically ill. He was a beautiful, here was a beautiful sunny town of people enjoying life and people being trained to murder other people in large numbers. To this day, I cannot imagine why I need a particular explanation for finding that unbearably revolting. I want to hear an explanation from someone who doesn't find it so. Oh, they tell us, we all find war to be troubling, but being a grown-up means having the stomach to do having the stomach to do what's needed to prevent something worse. The thing is, I never much trusted grown-ups. I wasn't revolted by the idea of war for it myself, while willing to let others engage in it. I refused to take it on faith that such a horror as war could be justified for anyone. After all. Like all kids, I had been taught to work out problems with words rather than fists. I had been told that it was wrong to kill, and like almost all people, I was viscerally inclined to resist the idea of killing anyone. If I was going to accept that in some cases it was right to kill lots and lots of people, and that it was right to always be training and building a huge war machine just in case a situation arose, then someone was going to have to prove that claim to me. In my experience, common wisdom was often wildly wrong. A huge industry of churches was maintained on Sundays to promote ideas that my parents, along with most people, took seriously, but which struck me as utter nonsense. The idea that war was peace came to seem to me so nonsensical on its face, I'd only believe it offered proof. If, if I'd only believe it if offered proof. Yet all such thinking was in the back of my head. I never thought I'd work as a peace activist until the moment I found myself doing so at age 35. 
It took me years, traveling, studying, dropping out of architecture school, teaching English in Italy, picking up a master's in philosophy at the University of Virginia, and working as a reporter and a press person before I found my way. I became a, an activist in my late 20s on domestic issues of criminal justice, social justice, and labor rights. I became a professional activist at age 30 when I went to work for ACORN, the association of community groups that scared so many powerful people that it was slandered in the media, defunded, destroyed several years later, and after I had moved on. I protested the first Gulf War and the build-up to a 2003 war in Iraq, but I became something of a spokesperson and writer against war when I worked as press secretary for Dennis Kucinich's presidential campaign in 2004. He made peace the number one issue in his platform. He talked about peace, trade, and health care. Not that much on trade or health care. In 2005, I found myself working on a campaign to impeach and prosecute President George W. Bush for lying the nation into war. Congressman Dennis Kucinich introduced 35 articles of impeachment, selected from drafts of many more. I later published the articles as a book, with additional material from former federal prosecutor Elizabeth de la Vega and me on how to prosecute Bush for his war crimes. The titles of the 35 articles tell the story. Article 1. Creating a secret propaganda campaign to manufacture a false case for war against Iraq. Article 2. Falsely, systematically, and with criminal intent, conflating the attacks of September 11, 2001 with misrepresentation of Iraq as a security threat as part of fraudulent justification for a war of aggression. Article 3. Misleading the American people and members of Congress to believe Iraq possessed weapons of mass destruction to manufacture a false case for war. Article 4. Misleading the American people and members of Congress to believe Iraq posed an imminent threat to the United States. Article 5. Illegally misspending funds to secretly begin a war of aggression. Article 6. Invading Iraq in violation of the requirements of H.J. Res. 114. Article 7. Invading Iraq absent a declaration of war. Article 8. Invading Iraq, a sovereign nation, in violation of the UN Charter. Article 9. Failing to provide troops with body armor and vehicle armor. Article 10. Falsifying accounts of U.S. troop deaths and injuries for political purposes. Article 11. Establishing of permanent U.S. military bases in Iraq. Article 12. Initiating a war against Iraq for control of that nation's natural resources. Article 13. Creating a secret task force to develop energy and military policies with respect to Iraq and other countries. Article 14. Misrepresentation of a felony, misuse and exposure of classified information and obstruction of justice in the matter of Valerie Plain Wilson, clandestine agent of the Central Intelligence Agency. Article 15. Providing immunity from prosecution for criminal contractors in Iraq. Article 16. Reckless misspending and waste of U.S. tax dollars in connection with Iraq and U.S. contractors. Article 17. Illegal detention. Detaining indefinitely and without charge persons both U.S. citizens and foreign captives. Article 18. Torture. Secretly authorizing and encouraging the use of torture against captives in Afghanistan, Iraq, and other places as a matter of official policy. Article 19. Rendition. Kidnapping people and taking them against their will to black sites located in other nations, including nations known to practice torture. Article 20. Imprisoning children. Article 21. Misleading Congress with the American people about threats from Iran and supporting terrorist organizations within Iran with the goal of overthrowing the Iranian government. Article 22. Creating secret laws. 
Article 23, violation of the Posse Comitatus Act. Article 24, spying on American citizens without a court-ordered warrant in violation of the law of, and of the Fourth Amendment. Article 25, directing communications companies to create an illegal and unconstitutional database of the private telephone numbers and emails of American citizens. Article 26, announcing the intent to violate laws with signing statements. Article 27, failing to comply with congressional subpoenas and instructing former employees not to comply. I'm going to skip the rest because all of these are pleas for the government to follow their own laws, which by this point should be obvious, they don't. Skipping to the end of the article, working on this project meant working closely with and becoming part of the peace movement even while engaged in something less than peaceful, seeking to put someone on trial and imprison him. I immersed myself in online and real-world activism, organizing, educating, and protesting. I strategized, lobbied, planned, wrote, protested, went to jail for protesting in or sitting in congressional offices or in the streets in front of the White House, did interviews, and pressed for peace. Needless to say, we did not impeach Bush, and I wish it were needless to say, when it comes to abusing power, Obama has been proven to be worse than Bush was. But we did educate the public about war lies, thereby turning people against the war on Iraq, and later against the war on Afghanistan. Opposition to attacking Iran, which has thus far prevented it, has grown out of rejection of lies closely resembling those told about Iraq. A new war on Libya became unpopular faster than any previous U.S. war. There were downsides, too, and even seeming hypocrisy in the peace movement. We don't always behave peacefully towards one another. We don't always share the same vision. Some groups favor peace when doing so helps a political party, and otherwise, are very accepting of war. Some honestly think particular wars are crimes but deem others to be justified. Some try to work with corrupted insiders. Some try to bring pressure from outside the halls of power. Some try, with great difficulty, to bridge some of those gaps. But my peace movement experience overall has been incredibly positive. I've made good friends, who I see a handful of times a year, on stages or in streets, and as often as not in police vans. The full-time peace activists, most of them whom have other full-time paid employment and serve no particular organization, but hold the movement together with their spirit and reliability, these are people with more great stories than any writer will ever get on paper or computer screens. These are the people for whom, outside of my family, I am most grateful. If any of them had ever been visible in the way military recruiters and toy soldiers are visible, perhaps I would have found my way to the peace movement sooner. My focus, or approach, may evolve, but I cannot imagine ever leaving. In 2009 and 2010, I wrote two books, the second one on the question of whether any war had ever been justified. The title is a giveaway of the conclusion I reached, quote, war is a lie. And it isn't just any lie. It's the justification of the worst thing anyone has ever devised. Ending it now is no longer a question of man of making the world more pleasant, but a question of survival, weapons proliferation, blowback, economic collapse, environmental collapse, political collapse. Choose your poison. War will destroy us in one or more of these manners, unless we put an end to it. Why in the world would anyone not want to? These are the words of David Swanson, peace activist, from Why Peace, edited by Mark Gutman.